Blog Talk Radio. The Archons wanted to deceive man since they saw that they had a kinship with those that are truly good. They took the name of those that are good and gave it to those that are not good so that through them they make them be removed from those that are not good and place them among those that are good. These things they knew for they wanted to take the free man and make him a slave to them forever. This particular passage discusses how the enemy utilizes deception um, and often names its own uh, beast system and the idols that they worship after what would be the names or um, the authority of Christ. Yahushua, even as the morning star, um, that is something that was usurped by Lucifer. 
the morning star and the name of the morning star. And certain symbols and things have been changed. Even the way that Cain in his bloodline, how he named his children also um, after certain peri- patriarchs and and the serpent knew to do these kind of things to create confusion and to lead humanity astray. Uh, today we're going to talk about the two trees in paradise and to take this story all the way back to the beginning uh, as far as um, our ancestors, Adam and Eve, and the beginning of the Second World Age, our entrance into the flesh, how all these things tie together with the loss of immortality, the loss of our first estate, and our being placed in arena, an arena, a battleground, so to speak, um, of reality, of existence, where we would be challenged by the duality of both good and evil, the dual nature of pain and pleasure, and come to know through experience through uh, the experience of flesh and being in the flesh, what those kind of experience, how they um, inflict soul and how they burn into the essence of memory. And that's, you know, life experience for, for us. And for everybody. And so we're going to talk a little bit about these things because a lot of people uh, have a lot of the stories kind of mixed up and confused um, and and have never really looked deeper into the aspect of that one particular parable, um, have never sought to decipher it in any way, not meaning that you have to do it in that way. But everybody just assumes that, you know, fruit is a fruit and that uh, because it's been historically displayed as an apple that, you know, we assume that this fruit was an apple and that this apple was responsible for the fall or what has come collectively and historically to be known uh, in the memory of humanity as our collective fall. And and so why was it that that fruit led to our fall and, and entrance into this world where we would be challenged by, you know, this experience of good and evil? Uh, why is it that we have to be in the flesh now? What is all this about? Is there purpose? Is there a higher ordination for each one of us and especially for those that choose to embrace remembrance and come to know self and um and coming to know self decide to work for the morning star administration and give themselves as servants unto the most high and his son to be utilized in whichever way uh, they should choose to utilize each one of us. That is the greatest and the highest purpose that we can aspire to as a spiritual being because, in essence, that's the kind of rebirth, that's the kind of um, return to innocence that one will need to, uh, to be hopefully counted among the elect so that one can aspire to a return to our first estate and be counted among the righteous and the elect that have part in salvation and eternal life. And that there's no greater purpose for being. And really, that's what each one of us are here for, and that's what uh, the lesson of each day essentially is about. Even though, you know, we can choose to focus where it is we desire and to essentially worship with our time whatever pursuit, whatever focus, whatever uh, goal, dream, or God you choose to. um, Because really, 
behavior, action. It's it's not what people say as far as whom they uh, say they worship and who they say they follow. Because uh, this is essentially, you know, just like politics, a lot of people say one thing and then do a completely different thing or front one way just to trick people into thinking that they are a certain way but are essentially just giving, wearing masks, wearing masks. And the true person is never known until the the secrets um come out and 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 so for a lot of people we really we really don't know who people are and which side they are working for and the another aspect of the teaching today is talks about the trees and us as humanity as trees as trees and also as a seed the bears and seed um, because we give off progeny in that way and the the word utilizes the same symbolism to discuss uh, generations and family lines and bloodlines and and so um, that will also tie into all these things Uh, one other thing I want to talk about and then we can actually go into this teaching and I'll be checking the chat room for those that want to give uh, any questions. Um, feel free to place them there. Uh, I'll check the chat room periodically. This is a one-man show, so please forgive me if I do miss the question, if the um, you know, dialogue is happening fast and, and the chat room is moving quickly. Sometimes I will do that, but if that happens, just please um, paste it in there again and I will try to get to it. Uh, Another aspect of what we're going to be talking about today with notice the title of the show is the two or the trees of paradise. Meaning that paradise and what people have come to know as the garden of Eden or and the garden of Eden is, has an association with the earth. uh, These two places are completely different. And and most people don't realize that. Paradise is where our ancestors, Adam and Eve, were taken to after their creation. And they, they were protected. It was the garden of the Lord. And it gave of its fruit abundantly. There were uh, said to be fruit in there that changed, I mean, trees in there that grew a different fruit for every month of the year. Um, and so there was, and it was, so yielding a game of itself in massive abundance so that, you know, fruit was readily available for all the creatures that needed to be fed by the paradise of of the Father. And it was set up as such, even with the various streams. They give description of the four rivers and how those rivers also fed and nourished all of creation. And we're going to talk about that too because there's a number of texts where you can go to to get a, a little glimpse on the differences between paradise and the Garden of Eden. And a lot of those books have to do with the ascension of a, one patriarch or another through the ten heavens. And often what you will see is that in the description of the patriarchs as they're ascending up through the ten heavens, they come to the third heaven, and the third heaven is where paradise is and is is also a place um, like an extension of Tartarus in that across the arc. Kesian Lake, I believe is what it's termed or called. This is the Lake of the Dead that separates paradise from uh, um, from this, like, Sheol. Um, it talks about that both are, are found there also in the third heaven. 
and it will give a description of each one of these different heavens because um, if you also study a, a the fall of the Nephilim and the Watchers, you realize that they only have a, availability to reach as high as the sixth heaven. And the sixth heaven is called Sophia Wisdom. This is um, this is where invisibility separates from visibility. This is where light and darkness separate the unseen from the seen, the perishable from the imperishable. Um, and they are not allowed into the higher heavens. They have been banished from the higher heavens. Um, even in some of the descriptions, and I'll give you the exact text that I'm talking about, because uh, there's, there's one by Isaiah, there's one by Enoch, there's another one by Paul, there's also one by Peter uh, that is not fully detailed, but they do give confirmation of each other as to the ten heavens and as to uh, paradise being located at the third heaven and that that was where we fell from and that when Adam and Eve were tricked into eating that first fruit, whatever that fruit was, and we're going to discuss this as well, uh, that when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, they lost their bright natures initially. They lost what was called their uh, light vestures, their clothing of light. And having done so, they would then be banished from paradise and being placed into the, what was then called the Garden of Eden. And that was on this earth, and this earth was already inhabited and already uh, occupied by what were the fallen ones, the rebel angels that were already cast out of their first estate. They already had reign here upon the earth. They already had established culture and civilization and had already interdicted themselves into the affairs of what was the called the primitive worker or the Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, the pre-Adamic uh, aspects of humanity that were found, even uh, the pygmy races and the coneheads. Um, you have all kind of different and interesting creatures found. And what's interesting also is that a lot of them were living all at the same time, which is uh, uh, unique as far as, you know, the the whole Darwinism, everybody wanting to say that each man evolved of another and that, you know, there's these missing links going back to the monkey. Uh, when you have the monkey right here with us today and you can put a chimpanzee and a, a human side by side and people say that we come from this and how you can accept that is just beyond me, but a lot of people do. I understand it's taught in schools, but come on, people, critical thinking. Um, anyway, so we'll we'll talk about this, too, because paradise is a whole different place, and that's the place we fell from. When we came here to the earth, when we were banished here and placed here on the earth on what was the eighth day, completely separate day, and there's a whole set of texts that deal with this uh this um what what became known as the elevation of humanity uh from our fallen state there's a whole set of texts that deals with this that people don't understand cuz they're trying to say that this story is the same one that's being talked about in Genesis and it isn't and that's why a lot of people don't understand the gnostic text and that's why i i believe a lot of people even after they study them, they they don't understand how to comprehend them and to um, associate them into the timeline, into the summation of what is the rest of the words, the Old Testament, New Testament, the pseudepigraphal works, the apocryphal. Because in my opinion, again, um, don't believe anything I say. Go out and study these things for yourself. Confirm them for yourself. But in my opinion, 
there's an underlying truth that ties all of the teachings together. And that once you can see this, it's like, wow, how did I, how did I not see this? How did I, how did I not understand it this way? Um, but before we go into the text, I want to make one news, one news um, announcement, a current event, because I think this is important enough that it should be mentioned and that people should have a chance to look at it for yourself. I'm going to paste the link in the chat room. And this is an article in World Net Daily that just came out, and it talks about the existence of 35 terror training camps now operating inside, inside the United States of America. The government knows about them. They're doing nothing to impede them, and um, and these people are are brewing terrorists right in our own country, and. You know, what was also shocking to me um, after reading the particular article is in that the last paragraph of the article, it mentions two of these places as being right here within my own hometown near Athens, Georgia, you know, near Atlanta, Georgia. One of them being outside of commerce and the other one being uh, close as well. And so... This will be interesting and eye-opening for a lot of those that have studied about the New World Order, that know about the FEMA concentration camps and about how uh, even in World War II, the infrastructure was already in place when Hitler invaded these other countries to then be utilized for the purpose of uh, eradicating and killing people. And, And that infrastructure is right here currently in place in America in the same way. So reading this, it says, Washington, a radical jihadist group responsible for nearly 50 attacks on American soil is operating 35 terrorist training camps across the nation, but the United States government refuses to include the organization on the State Department's list of foreign terrorists. Jamal ul Fukra, known in the U.S. as Muslims of America, has purchased or leased hundreds of acres of property from New York to California in which the leader, Sheikh Mubarak Gilani, boasts of conducting the most advanced training courses in Islamic military warfare. In a recruitment video captured from Gilani's Soldiers of Allah, he states in English, we are fighting to destroy the enemy. We are dealing with evil at its roots, and its roots are America. And though Gilani and his organization is suspected of committing assassinations and firebombings inside the U.S., and us also suspected of beheading uh, murder of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl in Pakistan, the terrorist camps spread through the country, continue to expand in numbers and population. A documentary called Homegrown Jihad Terrorist Training Camps around the U.S. provides compelling evidence of how Muslims of America operate with impunity inside the U.S. In the video, producers visited some camps, attempted to visit others, and interviewed neighbors and local police officials. It is also include excerpts of the Muslims of America recruitment video. Homegrown Jihad, look it up. The recruitment video shows American converts to Islam being instructed in the operation of AK-47 rifles, rocket launchers, and machine guns, and C-4 explosives. It provides instructions on how to kidnap Americans, kill them, and how to conduct sabotage and subversive operations. Jamaat ul fukra attacks on American soil range from Bombings to murder to plots to blow up U.S. landmarks. A 2006 Department of Justice report states that Jamal al-Fukra has more, quote, has more than 35 suspected communes and more than 3,000 members spread across the United States, all in support of one goal, 
the purification of Islam through violence. In 2005, the Department of Homeland Security predicted that the group would continue to carry out attacks in the United States. Act like, uh, this is a quote, scary. Act like you are his friend, then kill him, says Jelani in the recruitment video, explaining how to handle American infidels. Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Perrow Pearl was attempting to interview Jamal Ufukra's leader, Jelani, in 2002 when he was kidnapped and later beheaded. One year later, Inyam Ferris, member of both Jamal Ufukra and Al-Qaeda, pleaded guilty in federal court to plot to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge. Jelani was at one time in Pakistani custody for the abduction of Pearl. Intelligence sources also suggest a link between Jamal Fukra and Richard Reed, the infamous shoe bomber who attempted to ignite explosives aboard a Paris to Miami passenger flight December 22, 2001. What we are witnessing here is kind of a brand new form of terrorism, says FBI Special Agent Jody Wise in the documentary. These homegrown terrorists can prove to be as dangerous as any known group, if not more so. As World Net, Data, World Net Daily reported, a covert visit to Jamal Ufukra and Kamen in upstate New York by the Northeast Intelligence Network found neighboring residents deeply concerned about military-style training taking place there, but frustrated by the lack of attention from federal authorities. Uh, just a little bit more, because I think this is important enough that it should be covered. Muslims of America is incorporated, a tax-exempt organization, has been directly linked by court documents to Jamal Ufukra. The organization operates communes of primarily black American-born Muslims throughout the United States. The investigation confirmed members commonly use aliases and international spelling variations of their name and routinely deny the existence of Jamal Ufukra. The group openly recruits through various social service organizations in the United States, including the prison system. Members live in compounds where they agree to abide by the laws of Jamal Fukra, who are considered to be above local, state, and federal authority. U.S. authorities have probed the group for charges ranging from links to al-Qaeda to laundering and funneling money into Pakistan for terrorist activities. The organization supports various terrorist groups Operating in Pakistan and Kashmir, and Jelani himself is linked directly to Hamas and Hezbollah. Jelani's American headquarters is in Hancock, New York, where training is provided to recruits who are later sent to Pakistan for more jihadist paramilitary training, according to law enforcement authority. So here you have the FBI, local sheriffs, all these, they know. They know about these places. Oh, I got to read this last paragraph. Um, well, yeah, I'm going to read this because it's important. A Justice Department report to law enforcement agencies prepared in 2006 provides a glimpse into how long Jamal Fukra or Muslims of America has been operating inside the U.S. Over the past two decades, a terrorist group known as, this is quoted, over the past two decades, a terrorist group known as Jamal Fukra or Community of the Impoverished has been linked to multiple murders, bombings, and various other felonies throughout the United States and Canada, end quote. Gilani's communes are described by law enforcement as classically structured terrorist cells. Seven of the compounds have been identified as training facilities. Marion, Alabama, Commerce, Georgia, Macon, Georgia, Tallahassee, Oklahoma, York County, South Carolina, Dover, Tennessee, and Red House, Virginia. Other compounds are located in California, Colorado, Texas, Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington, Michigan, and West Virginia. So, we thought 
we thought the United Nations troops, the the peacekeeping troops, the ones that they always un- unveil at the end of emergencies to beat on local populations that usually have no affiliation, no uh, no kind of kinship with that population, so they don't mind beating them mercilessly. And if you don't think the United Nations is involved in terror, well, just look it up. Just look it up. United Nations peacekeeping troop. Type a word like rape afterwards or, or murder or anything similar and, and see what comes up. Because the United Nations, for those that still believe it's a good agency, an international group that actually cares for the likes of the world and wants to bring about policy changes and uh, laws that would be beneficial for everybody everywhere, you're delusional. Look into the history and the people that brought about the United Nations and all these international groups. They're funded by the elitists. They were created by the elitists for the sole purpose of being controlled by the elitists. And just because the United Nations has a reputation that goes back 40 or 60 years or however much and it's been recognized by countries all over the world, really, how much has the United Nations done to stop war and to not uh, allow wars and terror to form it? They foment the wars. They support the terrorist groups. And they're just another arm of what are the oppressive uh, branches of shadow government found within all of our nations and countries of the world, which is a sad thing, but it's the way it is. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that. And to realize that the agenda, the elites have an agenda. Now, look at, read for yourself, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which is not a Jewish document. It was not only fomented and created and propagated by the elders of Zion, as it states. They put that on as a label so that the group would be as the synagogue of Satan, those that say they are Jews but are not. Because essentially Lucifer disguises himself in every uh, mask he can wear, every gender, every race of being, every color of person, every kind, even the transsexuals and the the newly cyborg and uh, the hybrid created. I mean, Lucifer wears all masks. So, anyways, this also ties into, you know, the story that we're going to go into as far as paradise, the differences of it, the two trees. So, let's go ahead and go into that. But Hello, Deborah. Thank you for joining us, and welcome everybody again. Let's give a shout out to uh, Gray and Brenda and... Uh, Sherry and for fun and jazz always Deborah and all the other listeners uh, the guests we appreciate all of you and thanks for supporting this show and we hope that we uh, bring forth information that is worthwhile to you and um, all right the differences between paradise oh and I was telling you about the the different books let me go ahead and tell you about this first uh, for those that want to read the stories of the patriarchs going through the ten heavens that want to get confirmation of this for yourself. One book, The Ascension of Isaiah, gives a a beautiful description of Isaiah being taken up through the ten heavens, being brought before the Lord, and also being commanded to be witness of the Father sending the Son to embodiment within the flesh and how he would be born of a virgin. Because remember, Isaiah is the patriarch that wrote many of the prophecies that were later then fulfilled by what would be you know, known as our Lord, Emmanuel, uh, Yahushua, 
Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, and so he fulfilled a lot of what Isaiah was given privilege to see. So that one's the ascension of Isaiah. Another one, uh, which is really interesting and which is one of the best pseudepigraphal books that I've ever read in its detail on paradise, and not only paradise, but the extensions of Sheol and Tartarus as they have to do with the third heaven. Uh, It's called The Visions of Paul. The Visions of Paul. And Paul is taken up through the ten heavens and also brought to paradise to meet with the other patriarchs that have already been taken there to to put on their garments of light, but they have not yet received their crowns and their thrones. And you can actually get confirmation of that in another one of the books called the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, where Enoch is taken through the ten heavens and brought before the face of the Lord and commanded to be as a witness, as a testament, as to the behavior of the watchers in performing their evil and uh, for going a whoring, as Enoch says, a whoring after the daughters of men and lusting after the daughters of humanity, then birthed what were the unnatural hybrid giants that became known as the uh, the Nephilim, the giants, the fallen ones, the earthborn, the men of renown. The giants were the hybrid seed one born from that particular incursion. And it also talks about in the Kebra Nagath, K-E-B-R-A-N-A-G-A-S-T, chapter 100, Kebra Nagath, for those that also want to list this up yourself, very interesting passage and story and chapter. In this particular passage, this chapter 100 of the Kebra Nagath, it focuses on the fall of the watchers and their entrance into the flesh and their uh, corruption, how they challenged the Lord and the Lord put them into m- men's forms, into human form. And that's why they were able to mate with the daughters of men. And falling, it also speaks about how the giants that were born of this interbreeding, how it was not a natural birth, but how they ripped their mothers open, coming out through the bellies of their mothers, and how their mothers died in the birth of these unnatural beings. And I would say that would be judgment. Have a monster growing in you like that? Oof. Anyways, Kevin the God. Another book that you can look to to get uh, an idea of the ten heavens and what's being discussed is the Apocalypse of Peter. The Apocalypse of Peter. This is a fragmented text, but in its fragmentation, it also gives you insight into the ten heavens, and it gives confirmation of paradise being at the third heaven. And so for those that have never done a study on the Ten Heavens, uh, very interesting, very, very interesting study. You will see how the Gregory, the Gregory, as Enoch calls them, the fallen ones, the the Nephilim or the Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, how they are located in the lower heavens and how they cry and lament at their judgment, knowing that they are going to be fully eradicated and and disappeared as if they had never been. And yeah, 
and anybody that knows that that is their judgment for the behavior and their just rewards, I, I would be sad too. And why wouldn't you be? Why wouldn't you be if you were going to be eradicated from existence? And so that's a good study because once you look into the Nephilim and the Giants and realize that, you know, the there was a group of angels that sinned against the Most High and the Son and that they were given judgment for it and that Tartarus and Hell, Sheol, that those places were created for those angels. Then you realize that you know, something even before us coming into the flesh and before earth was ever created and before this second world age and this judgment and this uh, way of being ever was, that there was something prior. And for those that study the gap theory that know about the differences between the creation being good and then being destroyed in Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, there's reason. You have to understand why it was that the earth became null and without form. Because the Lord had to destroy their culture, their civilization, and their efforts. And we're given vision of that. Jeremiah uh, chapter 4, verse 23. All that gives vision of the that first world day destruction. Okay, so uh, a, a quote then. Uh, let's find one. All right, this is from the vision of Paul. And it says this. And there were by the bank of the river trees planted full of different fruits. And I looked towards the rising of the sun, and I saw there trees of great size, full of fruits, and that the land was more brilliant than silver and gold, and there were vines growing on those date palms, and myriads of shoots and myriads of clusters on each branch. And I said to the archangel, What is this, my lord? And he said to me, This is the Archerusian Lake, and Within it, the city of God. All are not permitted to enter into it, except whosoever shall repent of his sins. And as soon as he shall repent and alter his life, he is delivered to Michael, and they cast him into the Archerusian lake, and then he brings him into the city of God. Near the righteous. And I wondered and blessed God at all that I saw. And the angel said to me, Follow me that I may bring thee into the city of God and into its light. And its light was greater than the light of the world and greater than gold and walls encircled it. And the length and the breadth of it were a hundred stadia I saw twelve gates exceedingly ornamented, leading into the city, and four rivers encircled it, flowing with milk and honey and oil and wine. And I looked and I saw in the midst of the city an altar great and very lofty, and there was one standing near the altar whose face shone like the sun. And he had in his hands a psaltery and a harp, and he sung the Alleluia delightfully, and his voice filled all the city. And after these things, the angel says to me, Behold, thou hast seen all the torments. Come, follow me, that I may lead thee away to paradise. Uh, Just so you know, um, there was a portion between this particular passage and what I had just read about Paul being taken into the city of God. And that particular portion goes into the torments of hell and why each one of these particular people 
because there's also levels of hell as well. Um, and so the different levels of hell are talked about. And th- what people did to get there is discussed in, in great description. And But I didn't uh, apply that here because I'm focused on paradise and not Sheol. And I know I, I always run out of time. So trying to keep the the passages short but informative. So going into the description of paradise now. And after these things, the angel says to me, Behold, thou hast seen all the torments. Come, follow me, that I may lead thee away to paradise, and that thou mayst change thy soul by the sight of the righteous. For many desire to salute thee, and he took me by an impulse of the Spirit and brought me into paradise. And he says to me, This is paradise where Adam and Eve transgress. Notice. This is from where Adam and Eve had fallen, and that this is not on the earth. That's a whole different place. Paradise is a completely separate place. That's where Yahushua went to prepare his house with many mansions, his father's house with many, you know, many mansions, many rooms. That's where we're gonna. That's our first estate. That's where we're gonna return back to paradise. All right. And he says to me, this is paradise where Adam and Eve transgressed. And I saw there a beautiful tree of great size on which the Holy Spirit rested. And from the root of it were come forth all manner of most sweet-smelling water, parting into four channels. And I said to the angel, my Lord, what is this tree, that there comes forth from it a great abundance of this water? And where does it go? And he answered and he said to me, Before the heaven and the earth existed, he divided them into four kingdoms and heads, of which the names are Python, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. And having again taken hold of me by the hand, he led me near the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said to me, This is the tree by means of which death came into the world. And Adam took of the fruit of it from his wife and ate. And thereafter they were cast out hence. And he showed me another, the tree of life, and said to me, This, the cherubim and the flaming sword guard. All right, I'm going to read you a passage about paradise from the book of Enoch, and then we'll talk about this. And those men took me thence and led me up onto the third heaven and placed me there. I looked downwards and saw the produce of these places such as has never been known for goodness. And I saw all the sweet flowering trees and beheld their fruits, which were sweet smelling, and all the foods borne by them bubbling with fragrant exhalation. And in the midst of the trees, that of life, in that place whereon the Lord rests, when he goes up into paradise, and this tree is of ineffable goodness and fragrance, and adored more than every existing thing. And on all sides it is in form gold-looking and vermilion, and fire-like and covers all, and it has produce from all fruits. Its root is in the garden at the earth's end, and paradise is between corruptibility and incorruptibility. And thence they go forth along the earth and have a revolution to their circle, even as other elements. Here there is no unfruitful tree. Every place is blessed. There are 300 angels, very bright, who keep the garden, and with incessant sweet singing and never silent voices, serve the Lord throughout all days and hours. 
And so, um, you can you can tell if you really do an in-depth study of the differences, you'll realize that yeah, Garden of Eden, where we uh, are now after the fall, is a different place from paradise, and that's important to understand. Now, as far as the two trees represented in, in paradise, we know that the tree of life represents life, immortality, eternity, uh, and the living. And it is also representative of Yahushua. And and we know that Yahushua um, is, is the Lord of our line as far as the Seth line, and that it says that in the book, um, in Matthew, it talks about how he is our father, and he is the responsible for uh, birthing the good seed. And the reason this is said is because, as it says on the origin of the world, Yahushua is called the first Adam. And it was in his likeness, in his image, that modern humanity, six-day Adam of paradise, was made in the image of, as a replication of, that the six-day Adam was called Adam of paradise, the second Adam. And this particular passage is so very important because it also describes and details the account of the third Adam, which is known as Adam of flesh. And this Adam was the one that was cast out of paradise and recreated into flesh form. This is the state of being, this fleshly state of being. This is the form that we inhabit now. Um I'm going to go to one passage here. You look in the chat room. Okay. Going into this particular passage. Because this ties it together from the from the word. Adam came into being from two virgins, from the spirit and from the virgin earth. Christ, therefore, was born from a virgin to rectify the fall which occurred in the beginning. So Christ coming into the flesh had everything to do with redeeming us as fallen beings, as fallen creatures. And that when we fell into the flesh and we were made, recreated into bodies of flesh, this is when we began... Uh, life on the wilderness of the earth and what would be the duality, the duality of both knowing good and evil. And it's important to understand that this place that we are now is a place where we fell to and that we have um, goal and aspirations to return to our first estate for those that come to remember it. For those that understand what is truly being revealed within the word and how the battle, the war between the bloodlines, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, how this war goes back even before the creation of modern Adam and Eve. This, this war goes back to the, to the war in heaven, to the rebellion of Lucifer against our Lord, and to their being cast out. It was when they were cast out, and they, you know, Lucifer decided to be as the most high on the self, and to uh, try to place his throne above the throne of our Lord, and and to take over his dominion and to assume worship to be as gods themselves and how he tempted a third 
of the angels to also to join in fullness in his rebellion. That they gave of every aspect of themselves to join to his dream of self-rule. And how their dedication to evil is is so adamant that the Lord had to judge them in condemnation and total annihilation. And even then, they still continue with the corruption. And even with greater vigor. And so you have to know that why is there evil present in this world? Why everywhere we look, we see uh, goodness being challenged in every way and being tried in every way, people being arrested just for allowing their kids to run around outside, uh, uh, people getting arrested for just trying to have Sunday school classes or Bible study in the house, people being arrested for being missionaries, for trying to feed the homeless. It seems like goodness is being outlawed and that evil is being everywhere rewarded and that people know that in order to get along and to get ahead within the system that is necessary for them to stoop to the level of joining the matrix and and working the system in the unspoken parameters that have been established by society. And so if you want to play the game, there's a certain way that they allow evil to get ahead. That's what the brotherhoods, the the elitist groups, the Freemasonic societies, the secret organizations and their promise of secret knowledge and information which only a few are privy to, that with the promise of such secrets and such elitism that many people would stoop to untold levels to be part of and join into such organizations. And if they get rewarded and also promoted for being as part, which we know that the Illuminati, Skull and Bones, all those organizations that they reward their members in a system at every way, even if they're in trouble with law, that justice really means just us. Just us, the rich elite that can afford to buy justice and and the rule of law because that's what it takes. And it's sad. It's sad that that's the way it is. But that's why that's why we see evil perpetuate and, and paralyzingly uh, paralyzingly present everywhere within our world system and view. So, all right, going back to the two trees because you know again. Yahushua represents life, and and he is also the the reason why in Genesis three fifteen that he was the promise, the fulfillment of the one that crushed the head of the serpent. It was his coming into the flesh and dying a sinless life, and and exampling to us innocence and purity. And the Father, you know, what it means to be part of and connected to the Father and be a pre-existent one. Because 
Yahushua revealed to us that he was from the beginning and prior to the beginning and that that he was the fulfillment and and not just a normal everyday person uh, that happened to be born because there was no randomness as far as his birth and every aspect of what he did no randomness and so um go to one other thing i'm going to read a couple of passages that talk about the tree the two trees that were also in paradise and this comes from the the gospel of philip it's, it'll give us a little bit of insight and and bring about some things that people may have not heard about. You can look into this yourself. Pretty interesting information. And it has to do with what I said. All right. The rulers thought it was by their own power and will that they were doing what they did. But the Holy Spirit in secret was accomplishing everything through them as it wished. Truth which existed since the beginning, is sown everywhere, and many see it being sown, but few are they who see it being reaped. Interesting passage. And what is also interesting about the various Dagamata codices and the different texts, is that they um, they speak about these rulers, these powers, these principalities, these rulers of darkness, not of this world, calls them the archon, and speaks about their their effect, their influence on our lives, and how the the old church patriarchs, those that were of the early church, how they knew about these beings and their interdiction and how they were responsible for evil. Because if you don't know about the fallen angels and you don't know about that they were responsible for uh, even the creation of armaments, for teaching women how to abort their own children, for for even the creation of of makeup and ornamentation, jewelry, uh, the beautification of of the daughters of humanity, uh, that they were responsible for the implementation of uh, cannibalism, victim sacrifice, uh, the offering of children to idols and to the, the fallen angels who were the pagan gods of the old world. And unless you understand that they were the ones that brought evil into the world and destroyed the innocence of humanity, that they were the ones that corrupted us to the core and led us to astray in such way that they can no longer... They can no longer even supplicate the Lord in prayer. How they can not even sing to him and worship. There's a description of this in the book of Enoch also. As Enoch is taken up through the ten heavens, he's given a vision of the Gregory and, like I said earlier, in their lamentation. Their, um, their sadness at knowing judgment is coming upon them and for them. And that they had committed evil and behavior in such way that they now are going to have to pay the consequences for it. All that free will that they determined to take upon themselves and to do as they wished, to create as they wished, and to go about and be as gods themselves, 
that determination led them to their condemnation. And for a lot of people on the planet now and in flesh form now, we are also uh, reaping the reward of our actions and our behaviors and what was the election of our first estate. But being in flesh now, we are responsible for everything we do in this, this age with our thoughts, our behavior, what we choose to focus on and, and attract with our intent. And so that's why, you know, we you have to do the study. You have to become not knowledgeable on truth and and really put forth the effort to come to know the Father and the Son because they are truth. They're the ones that can unfold this discernment for you because there's so much to come to understanding on now. It almost seems like there's not enough time. It almost seems like it's it's just too much, too much effort and too much to have to, to do. But you do what you can. Another passage from the Gospel of Philip says this. There are two trees growing in paradise. The one bears animals. The other bears men. Adam ate from the tree which bore animals. He became an animal, and he brought forth animals. For this reason, the children of Adam worship animals. This is talking about the fall. And, of course, people ask me this question. What would have happened if Adam and Eve had never eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And what if they had only eaten of the tree of life and all the other trees in the garden? What would have been the consequences of that for not only them, but for humanity? Here's the here's the answer. Adam and Eve, when they were in their immortal, bright-natured state of being, when they were as angels in heaven, tending the garden with the other supposedly 300 angels, also tending the garden, that if they would have just done as they had been commanded and never eaten of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have never have fell into flesh form. And if they would have never have fallen into flesh form, Children would have never been born. The whole second world age would never have came into being. And so life as we know it now, incarnation into the flesh as we know it now, a transformation a transformation of their spiritual bodies, their immortal, bright-natured bodies into bodies of flesh would have never have happened. The transformation that you read in the first book of Adam and Eve, where it, it talks about how they did not even understand how they were walking when they first began to take steps, and to me, that means that, you know, in their etheric form, in their angelic form, that they floated or they flew. But the whole uh, idea of taking steps was foreign to them. The experience of having to eat, of feeling the sun upon their skin, and also how the sun affected them differently once they were in their 
um, natural bodies into their flesh form, that in their spiritual state, they did not feel the burning sensation of sunshine. They didn't never experience a, a moment of darkness and a separation from the light. And all these things would not have happened if they had not been tempted and fall. And the temptation, like Satan, unfortunately was a necessary evil, was a necessary part of the unfolding of the great mystery because it's what brought us all here and what has given all of us renewed chance, renewed chance to not only come to understanding and knowledge of all these different things, but here we have a glorious opportunity to realign ourselves with knowledge and worship of the Father, the Creator, and His Son, and having that knowledge to serve them in the greatest capacity you can while you're still in flesh form. In this particular text, the Gospel of Philip, it makes mention many times of the necessity of people to become born again while in the flesh, to become knowledgeable about salvation and eternal life while in the flesh. Because it's within this flesh that realigning with the light and coming to remembrance about who you are, that you can then align your intent and your will with the salvation that has been promised to us, granted to us, extended to us by the Creator and His Son. Because they're the ones that set this all up. Everything was established from even before the foundations of this world. And that this truth, this outcome, this knowledge, this consequence, Everything is perfect in its unfoldment. All of it was necessary to bring us where we are now. There are no mistakes, no accidents, no perchance happening. Everything had purpose. Every moment led to every other aspect of being. And so... That's why we find ourselves where we are now. And for those of you, those of you that have been blessed to to come to remembrance about who you are and why you're here and what your purpose is really all about and that this world and this lifetime has everything to do with um, a higher purpose and a higher, uh, of what Christ calls a predestinated ordinance a special election. How blessed, how blessed we're we're so fortunate. We should be just so eternally grateful. You know, there's no way really to, in my mind, to show the true appreciation that the Father and the Son deserve other than just trying to be humble and thankful in every moment, just always thanking them for whatever it is that is, you know? And even if we were to be in perpetual prayer all moments for the rest of our lives, even then, we're still not worthy. And that still is not enough appreciation to show thankfulness to the to the creator for existence and being there's there's no words there's nothing we can do uh, other than just trying to love the father and the son and just be grateful and how you know how simple is that i mean if that's all we have to do what a blessing and follow his commandments and to do goodness for goodness sake 
doesn't seem that difficult. But I know it's the hardest walk. It's the hardest battle. And the reason being is because we are our own worst enemies. We are our own worst evil. The Shepherd of Ermoth, that book, The Shepherd of Ermoth, Mandate Number 6, it talks about how with each one of us is born an angel of righteousness and an angel of unrighteousness. And that within each one of us is the capacity for great goodness and great evil. Determined by our intent, our focus, and what we choose to project with our effort, with our way of being. And so I, I just give thanks. To, to the Father and to the Son, to uh, to the Holy Spirit for remembrance, for chance to serve. Because I think it's just the the most beautiful miracle for for any of us to be able to remember what all of this is about, and to remember our place and part within it, and to remember that our lives are not just this fleshly life, this one lifetime in the immortal journey of soul, that there is existence ongoing and forevermore for those that are grafted and counted as part of the sheep as part of his flock those that are written into the book of life. And what could be what could be a greater um, a greater understanding for life than knowing that the soul has permanence and that the spirit will be called home and that this isn't all of it, that this is only a small part of it, and that what we see and are witness to, even in the grand complexity of what is the great mystery everywhere around us, there's still so much more, so much more that we have opportunity to take part in and when we are returned to our first estate and when we are reunited with the Lord in full remembrance and given assignment to where we are sent out in service in whatever job capacity it is that we are aligned to and called to do I pray all of us are called to do something in service of the Father and the Son. But can you imagine serving as as angels to be ministering spirits and to um, maybe a a new seed, a new era, a new uh, unfolding eon of humanity and incarnation in the flesh for whoever. Maybe we'll be ministering spirits. Whatever it is that the Lord would want us to do, I think to be part of that, to have part of that, that's what I wish for all of you. That's what I would hope that you would want for yourself and that you would want to aspire to, that this would be the focus and the intent of your heart, the knowledge and the goal of your every aspect of being to come back into relationship with the Father and the Son and to come to remembrance on who you are and what all this is about and your place and part in it because you still have time. That's the most amazing thing. is The Lord is long-suffering to us. Even all the scoffers who every day ridicule and make fun of his people and the reality of his omnipotence, his power, his 
control over not only this world, but the entirety of the whole creation and universe. People mock him thinking that he has no control, thinking that he doesn't care, that he does no part in this reality and the unfolding of it. But for those of you that are truth seekers, that know the wisdom of the gospel, that understand the prophecies and their unfoldment and how everything has been 100% accurate and has been declared thousands of years prior and that we are even witness now daily to the fulfillment of prophecy and the wisdom and the truth and the knowledge contained within the word found in so many places. You know, here's the sad thing. So many of you, so many of you are lovers of the truth and that want to know all aspects of it. But yet so many are adhering to the traditions of belief systems or to their pastors or to other people that tell them that you know certain books are bad or to not read this or not read that or to limit yourselves in whatever way to keep truth from yourself, that we've all fallen into this paradigm where we police ourselves and we spring guilt, blame, and shame upon ourselves to, for even wanting to read some of these other books Please don't help the enemy in hiding truth from you. And don't let anybody be that determining factor for deciding for you what truth is. And don't be afraid to look into certain things. Of course, build your foundation on the Word. Know what it is you're about to get into and understand that you know, most of the countries of the world were brought up by the fallen angels and by the pagan cultures, by the false gods, and that their religions have been written in such ways that they do worship these fallen beings. And they do often sacrifice to them in whatever part of the world. But as long as you can understand that, and you understand that these peoples and these cultures that they were dedicated to that evil and, and not even knowingly as far as the fullness of what they were involved in. They thought these beings God. They thought these advanced beings as exactly that, evolved to such a degree that they would lead them into goodness and share goodness with them and to want betterment for them, but that was not the case. And the truth is contained within the Word. It teaches us and tells us about the two trees in paradise and how the enmity goes back to them and even to the rebellion, the previous war in heaven. And so you have to know that there's an enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and that that is what's being played out throughout history. Even with Israel and all the other nations of the Middle East, they're playing out the same, it's connected to the same thing, the enmity between the seed ones. And so in order for you to understand that, you have to you have to open yourself to those possibilities. I know so many people that are afraid to even look into the, the cane as being a serpent seed just because they are afraid to be labeled one of these serpent seed people or afraid to be made fun of by their pastors or their fellowship. Don't let all those influences control your seeking and your knowledge of truth. Don't allow these people to influence you in such a way that you will police yourself and keep yourself from the truth just because of guilt, blame, and shame. Um, take it before the Lord. He will be the determining factor on all these things. All these things. 
All right, let me see if there's a quote I can leave you with. I did not even get into all of the passages that talk about trees and the metaphors and the seeds and the two different lines. Um, Because things just go by so fast. But I think we did cover some very relevant information and talk about some things that were uh, at least of interest. All right, I'm going to find one last quote for you. Ah, here we go. Before Christ came, there was no bread in the world. Just as paradise, the place where Adam was, had many trees to nourish the animals, but no wheat to sustain man. Man used to feed like the animals, but when Christ came, the perfect man, he brought bread from heaven in order that man might be nourished with the food of man. The rulers thought that it was by their own power and will that they were doing what they did. But the Holy Spirit in secret was accomplishing everything through them as it wished. Truth, which existed since the beginning, is sown everywhere, and many see it being sown, but few are they who see it being reaped. Be a reaper. Reap truth in your life. Don't allow somebody else to determine what that is for you. Not even myself. Don't believe anything any of us say. Go out, do your own homework, do your own research. Put forth the effort. That's what builds relationship with the Father and the Son. That's what will drive your finding truth. That will open the doors for you. So, God bless all. I pray that the Lord watch over all of us, keep us all safe, lead us and guide us in discernment. And please, Lord, help us with our children. I myself am blessed that my son knows you, and I'm so grateful for that, Lord. But I know many, many are struggling, struggling with um, not of their own walk, Father, but in their walk with their children and trying to lead them and guide them in good discernment. Um, In Yahushua Yahweh's name, I pray for all of us. God bless all. Good night, and thank you again for joining us for another show.
fire. 